Hi everyone, my name is George Chow, yep, and uh, um, I'm an undergraduate here. I'm just your average undergraduate student here in, at the U, really, I am. But I get to do research with some of the coolest, most brilliant people I've ever met. Some research I do is in the Myers lab, this is a bioinformatics lab, um, Newfound lab, which is a genetics lab, and in the Keef lab, which is a um, computer science visualization lab. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I get to do, which is really awesome. Um, so uh, these days, we have a lot of data lying around. And by data, I don't mean like uh, the old files, installation files, document files you have in your hard drive. No, I mean data at a much larger scale, terabytes of it. NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, stores and maintains tons and tons of DNA data, genomes worth of it. As you can see in this graph, they started in about 1982. But since then, they've grown exponentially. And now they have hundreds of millions of DNA sequences, millions of it. And that translates to hundreds of billions of base pairs. And I just want to stress that how amazing this is. Seriously, like even a couple of these sequences, 20, 30, million years, uh, 20 to 30 years ago, would have been worth millions of dollars. And now they're all freely available to us. I took a little search on NCBI, um, human genome, and found 2,720,000 matches. I mean, they're not all going to be human genomes, but that many sequences came up. And so I, I just want to stress how amazing this is. In fact, you can even get your own DNA sequence these days. So according to 23andMe, which is a personal genome service, if you just spit into a little tube and send it in, um, you can get your DNA sequence. All it takes is a little bit of spit <laughs> and one low price of $100. And I will be billing them for advertising them on a TEDx talk. But anyway, so humans have um, 23 chromosomes, well, 46, but you know, 23 infant ones with an X chromosome and maternal genes. Um, so this is a sample result of what you would get if you went and did the 23andMe thing. So take a look at this. You know, you see a couple of you know, base pairs. Do you see, does this mean anything to you? Can you understand something from just looking at this? Because if you can, you're brilliant, because I can't. And I've worked with DNA for a long time now. So is that data important? Well, our government certainly seems to think so. The Human Genome Project costs $3 billion. To put that in perspective, $1 billion is about 25,800 25, of your friend's annual salary. So $3 billion would be about 77,000 of your friend's annual salary. Or for you, 77,000 years of work. So that's a huge project, and that's just for one genome, one human genome. So let's take a look at a bit of DNA. This is an excerpt I took, um, about 3,000 base pairs of DNA from human chromosome 16. And contained within this is a hemoglobin alpha subunit. As you know, hemoglobin is the protein in your red blood cells that's able to carry oxygen. So if you look at this sequence, can you make anything of it? You know, can you be like, oh, this part makes sense? Yeah, this is, this is stuff. You know, I, I can see. Yeah, right there, it's important. Can you see where is the important part and where is the not so important part? So the important part of a DNA, which we call it exons, are here, here, and here. And uh, you couldn't really tell. Right? It took me forever to do that little highlighting because I had to look up that exact where it starts and then go and highlight there. It took forever. I mean, it's really hard. So the thing is, the point I want to make is that data, just for data's sake, just to get data, just to have data sitting there, it's garbage. It really is. If you have a lot of data and you can't do anything about it, you just have terabytes of data sitting there. Garbage. And so the way that we are trained to approach problems is that we, um, is that we propose a hypothesis we craft a series of well-thought experiments that have controls and variables that test this <coughs> hypothesis. And then you know, we ultimately you know, prove or disprove that hypothesis. But you know, we're not very good at dealing with large data sets. We can't look at that data like that human, you know, that human chromosome 16 data and be like, oh, yeah, this makes sense to me. You know, so that's why structure is necessary. 
Here's an example to prove that point. So I gave you a bunch of words on the screen. Do you see, can you understand what the words are trying to say to you? Maybe you, some of you can if you're really, really good at putting things together, but I think usually not. But introduce a little structure. And all of a sudden, this makes a lot more sense. It actually says, well, this is actually fairly simple. All that was needed was structure. This is where computer science comes into play. So graph theory is a subdivision, it's a sub-discipline of computer science that studies trees and how to do things with it. And to tell you the truth, when I first learned about graph theory in my computer science classes, I was really, I, I really didn't see a point. Because we, we spend extensive amount of time looking at things like this, trees, with, um, these no with leaves. Trees have leaves, the node, we also call them nodes, and they have branches. And what do we do with these trees? Well, we can traverse, travel them. We can go from nodes to node. And there's things called breadth-first search and depth-first search, all sorts of ways to travel within a tree. And once you learn how to travel in a tree, you can start to group the leaves by, uh, for example, how many um, non-overlapping routes are in between each, uh, each pair of nodes. So for example, in that group, there are three independent non-overlapping routes from any point to any other. And within this group, there are two, ooh, there are two independent points from any point, uh, routes from any point to any other. Then taking this, which we can call weights, so each of those branches have a weight of three, and the, in the other group, they have, they have a weight of two. So what can we do with this? We can do something called inverse weight distance, where we put, we, where we make branches of higher weight shorter, and branches of lower weight longer. Then you get something like this. And all of you are seriously looking at the screen right now, and being, and I see the expression on your face saying, so what? Because really, I actually tried to make the computer say that to me, because, you know, really, so what? Like, you are all looking really bored right now, I'm sorry. But I had to bore you to be able to do this. Let's introduce a little bit of context into this tree. All these leaves that you've been looking at, they're actual yeast genome, uh, they're actual yeast genes. And each of these branches represent a relationship between these genes. So all of a sudden, we moved from just playing around with leaves on a meaningless tree to you know, deducing data and learning about how genes interact and how genes are related to each other. And I'll talk about how these branches, how this data has gone obtained later. But I just want to stress that all of a sudden, this is important. And you can learn a lot of scientific information from just this. And if you apply this technique to an even higher level, um, then you can look at interactions between protein families, entire pro families of proteins, such as cell death, cell transport, cell function, uh, cell structure, and things like that. And if you take this and ap apply it at an even higher level, then you can look at relationships between organisms. And uh, like, for example, yeast, mice. And so all of a sudden, we went from a meaningless tree to being able to learn information like relationships between proteins. We can learn in information about how proteins function, how they work, how e protein families um, are related to each other, and even how organisms are related to each other evolutionarily. So this is an incredibly powerful tool that can get a lot of information easily and easily understandable for us. So in science, in life, maybe, I found that when I get a barrage of mind-blowing, cool you know, information, I like to take a step back and think, this is actually feasible. You know, like, am I really stretching this too far? Because you know, I thought so too at first when I you know, read about this idea, until I saw this. So as, as, as pretty as this thing is, I would like you to uh, take a moment and take a look at this. Think about what you might be seeing. If you like a hint, this I feel, personally, this looks awfully like the trees I showed you earlier. Well, it turns out that this tree is actually a genome-wide protein interaction mapping of yeasts. So every single point is a gene within a protein, uh, within yeast. And um, before I explain this tree farther, I'm going to go take a step back and uh, talk to you about how, this, how that tree, uh, tree was made. So yeasts are, or also known as Saccharomyces cerevisiae, is a really popular model organism. They have a roughly 6,000 genes, 
And what makes them so useful is that there's a wide array of DNA techniques, genomic, ge genetic techniques that can be applied to them. One of these techniques is synthetic lethality. So let's take an E cell. And the, let's say that the E cell has gene A and gene B. In a wild type, meaning normal E cell, these, both of these genes are functioning, and the yeast is happy, smiley face cut off. Um, but what happens if we take this E cell and uh, knock out one of these genes? And by knocking out a gene, I mean making it non-functional, so the gene doesn't work anymore. What happens to the E cell when that's gone? A lot of, sometimes it dies, of course, but a lot of times we find that the E cell still manages to live, and quite happily, I mean, look, it's still smiling. I mean, maybe not as widely as the previous one, but it's still smiling, you know. Maybe in a plate, rather than a million cell cultures, you will have like 500,000, which is still fine, you know, still happy. But then we can take that and cross it with another yeast with, another, with a different knockout. So now you have a yeast double mutant, meaning you have two knockouts. What happens to that? Well, we find that sometimes this, it dies. So this simple experiment, very easily done, demonstrate an important relationship between these, two protein, uh, between these two genes. The thing is, the fact that these two genes went by themselves knocked out allows the cell to live, but when two, both are knocked out, kills the cell. It means that these two genes have some sort of relationship. Either they do the, they're redundant, meaning they have the same row within the yeast cell, um, or that they're you know, along the same pathway, and that maybe when one is knocked out or non-functional, the other one starts to function, and when they're both knocked out, then that entire um, process, that entire um, function um, becomes non-functional within the E-cell. So all of a sudden, this graph makes a lot more sense. It's an aha moment, right? So each of these branches are an actual synthetic lethality re relationship between each, each of these genes. So all of a sudden, we gain credibility because this is supported by actual in vivo experimental data. This is just um, a slightly more intricate version of uh, my, my tree. But what this tree is, is this applied to all the, it's genome wide, so it's applied to all of the genes in the yeast genome. So a total, you, what you're looking at here, it may not look that obvious, it's 186,000 gene pairs in relationship to each other. So, if you look at it, do you see anything interesting besides the colors? Well, I'm sure you guys can tell already, but the colors actually give something away. They're highlighting the clusters that form in this East, mapping, uh, East um, gene mapping. And I do want to point out that there is no previous knowledge that went into this. We do not go and say, well, we know these things work together, so we're going to put them closer together. No, this did it by itself, and it formed these clusters. And what's really neat is that we can go and look at these clusters and look at proteins we know, and we find that they cluster together. For example, that cluster is transport protein cluster. And this cluster down here, the green one, is, um, it's cut off, but it's um, transcription regulation. And what's really neat about these clusters, let's zoom in on the transport cluster, is that we, can, we see that proteins we already know the function of that we've already characterized in labs actually group together on these without us telling it to. And so if you look at the, um, the tree, um, there are different colored nodes. There's you know, orange ones, purple ones, a couple of black ones. So the ones that are colored means that we already know the function of it. Um, like for example, the orange ones are colored with, um, uh, with autop meaning they, um, are fun they, are aut they have autophagic functions. And so what's really neat is that the orange ones are already grouped together by themselves without us telling them to. The, the lab I work in aut works on autophagy, actually, and the proteins we work with actually cluster themselves in there. And what's really neat is that this is like a family of proteins, but then in between families, they also cluster themselves um, by function. For example, autophagy and amino acid biosynthesis, ER and Golgi trafficking, um, they are all, you know, very related functions, and they all clustered into this transport protein, you know, cluster. And so what's really, what, and there, you've already heard a lot of cool things today and from just this talk, but what is the best part of this talk is right here. You see those black nodes? Well, I said we don't know what their function is, but you do now, don't you? If you look at where they are in this tree, you see that there's one black node 
in the group that's with the orange ones. So you can probably guess that that protein probably is involved in autophagy in some way. And you can see a number of black ones in that group that's amino acid and biosynthesis. So you can probably guess that those proteins probably function along that same route as well. So then what's really powerful about this is all of a sudden you can very intuitively and quickly visualize and understand um, protein and predict protein functions. Now let me go back a little bit to this large slide. I want to stress the importance of introducing structure to this data because, I mean, my simple little tree, you might think, well, I can do this by hand, you know, just count the numbers and do it. But with 186,000 gene pairs, do you think you can individually look at every single connection between every gene pair and try to, you know, cluster them together when they're high and pull them together farther when they're low between 186,000 gene pairs? Not, not as easily, right? Maybe you'll spend, you'll take, you know, an entire lab's worth of a lifetime to even get close to doing something like this. Whereas this can be generated within, day, like maybe in a day, by, the, by um, a well-written program. So today I talked about how computer science can be applied to genetics and how that can be used to yield very power, a, very a lot of information. So uh, that how, how powerful that computer science is as a technique to approach genetics and large amount of genetic data. But I'm sure a lot of you in the audience might be wondering, what else can it be used for? Maybe you've seen things like this before. Because really, this is just a new perspective to look at any field that involves a large amount of data. And that's pretty much any field, right? You can talk about linguistics. You can talk about economics. You can talk about operations. You can talk about social networks. You can talk about philosophy. And much, much more, right? Google, Facebook, they all use similar techniques in what we call data mining and just being able to gain information from data using a simple structure. So I guess the take home message today is to think about how some, a technique like this can be applied in your own field to make what seems like a lot of unusable data useful. Because thinking is what we do here at TEDx.